Thank you for joining us for today's message. You are about to hear a sermon by Pastor Brendan Beeler in our series, Out of Time, which is our study through the book of Revelation. During this series, we will be learning how to live every day as if it's our last. We are always excited to hear how God is working in your life. So if you have a story, please share it with us. You can do so by emailing us at yourstory@regeneratechurch.com. Also, if you desire to support this ministry financially, you can do so by clicking on the giving tab at regeneratechurch.com. Please help us continue to bring messages just like this one to people all around the world. Now, would you please prepare your heart for the Word of God? We've probably all heard this question. They usually interrupt you when you're sharing Jesus with them, and they will say this, Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you tell me about Jesus, l- let me ask you a question. What about the person that's never heard the gospel? The gospel is just the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. What about the people that have never been told about Jesus? How could a God of love send someone to hell who's never heard about Jesus? You know, those people that, that are in the jungle, and I don't know why everybody that's never heard about Jesus lives in the jungle, but there's always someone in the jungle. You know, the people that are in the jungle that have never been heard of Jesus, how could God send them to hell because they've never heard about Jesus? Now, there's two problems with that question. One is, there's an assumption being made that automatically people are sent to hell. The other assumption, or problem with that statement is it's not really their heart. It's really a, a deterrent. It's a distraction. It's to, to send the conversation on a rabbit trail to shield themselves from having to deal with the question, what are you going to do with Jesus? You see, that's a question that every single person is faced with. What are you going to do? Not what is someone else going to do, but what are you going to do? Not someone in another part of the country or another part of the world, but what are you going to do with Jesus? But you might say, well, what about the person that's never heard the gospel? You see, in the age of moral relativism, it rubs a lot of people the wrong way. When we say Jesus is the only way to God. Well, they'll say, I don't believe that. I believe that all roads lead to God. Perhaps you've heard that before. I wanted to tell you today, that's true. All roads do lead to God. Now, before you say, heresy, and stand up and walk out, let me tell you what I mean. It's Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 that says this. Each person is destined to die once, And after that comes judgment. Yes, all roads lead to God, whether you are an atheist, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, or whatever else you consider yourself to be, all roads do lead to God. Because every single person the Bible declares will stand before God at the end of their life. And each person will have to give an account to God based on their sin. And those that have not received the forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ will have to answer for their sin and pay the price for sin. See, the price for sin is death, damnation. It's what we all deserve. But as many of you know that Jesus gave his life, so he paid the price for our sin. So if we receive the forgiveness he offers, well, then the price has been paid. But if you do not receive what Jesus has offered, well, then you will have to answer for yourself and your own sin. So all roads do lead to God, but only one road leads to heaven, and that is the pathway through Jesus Christ. You can stand before God based on what you've done in your life, or you can stand before God based on what Jesus has done in giving his life. There's only one way to heaven. This is a non-negotiable belief in Christianity. And many people are trying to adopt, well, maybe there's other ways, 
But Jesus was as clear as he possibly could be when he said in John chapter 14, it says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Jesus didn't only say it. Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. And Luke records Peter saying about Jesus in Acts chapter four, verse 12, there is not salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by whom we must be saved. It's Jesus Christ. It's not Muhammad. It's not Allah. It's not Buddha. It's not Joseph Smith. It's not any other name, not any other person, no other way by which we are able to be saved other than Jesus Christ. The Bible is crystal clear. Well, then you might say, well, what about those then who have never heard about Jesus? If there's no other way to heaven than through Jesus, then what about those? Well, throughout history, God has revealed himself in many ways to humanity. God revealed himself from the very beginning of history to humanity through number one, you might wanna write this down, creation around us. Creation around us. Psalms 19, one says this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. No matter where you are at in the world, there is a voice declaring that there is a God. And this voice of creation declares day after day, over and over again, who God is. You see, creation is declaring that there is a God. And it says in verse four, their message has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So those that are in the ends of the world, perhaps a jungle in a tribe somewhere, you might say, well, how do they know about a God? The heavens declare, creation declares, God speaks through creation around us. Kepler the father of modern astronomy, who coined the word satellite. You, can, you know, you have some street cred when you are the one that invented the word satellite. He wrote, and I quote, the masterpiece of the planetary law of motion. When you re write a book that has that title, it just means that you're really, really, really smart. And he still has telescopes named after him on NASA's website. He said, and I quote, any astronomer that is an unbeliever is mad, end quote. A person who looks at creation, the galaxies, the vastness, and I wish I had the time to go in it today, about the heavens declaring the majesty of God. Anybody that doesn't believe in God, when you look around, you look up, or even look at your own body, it's crazy, it's insane to think that there's not a God. Romans chapter one, verse 20 says this, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. People might say, well, I don't see God. You know, he's invisible, I, I, I don't see him. Well, Romans 1, 20 says that creation reveals God. And it goes on to say, being understood by the things that are made, creation, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. People are without excuse because creation declares that there is a God. You see, to say that the human eye, with the speed that it takes in information, transfers it to the brain and then back and then to the nervous system to react, in the minuscule amount of time that it takes for that process to happen, or just the complexities of the human brain that still modern science can't even figure out that 
how the brain can put itself back together and through time can heal itself. And even the human eye and the complexities of our human body. People are, are baffled by, the, by how amazing our bodies are. And when they look at my body, they're even more baffled. No, I'm kidding. You might say, honey, look at my body. You'll know that there's a God. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. Bad news. <laughs> but even in the complexities of the human body, even in creation around us and osmosis and the human cell and just creation, the more you get into it and the more you look at science, you realize there has to be a God. Now, to say that the human eye, the body, the complexities of the atom and the human cell all came about randomly through random chance of evolution really to me is illogical. It takes a lot of faith to believe that. You see, the theory of evolution, people say, they, 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 they believe that because that's science. But, but I don't think you can come to that conclusion logically because science has to be tested and proved. There has to be a test subject and there's nothing to be tested when it comes to evolution. And I don't think you come to that conclusion logically. I think intuitively we know that there is a God. See, the person that believes in the theory of evolution makes a choice to believe that. And often that choice is made because of a lifestyle that a person wants to live that has no place for God in the universe. Because if there's a God, there's a judge. And if there's a judge, there will be a judgment. And if there's gonna be a judgment, then each of us will have to be accountable for the life that we live. And because people don't wanna be held accountable and want to do what they want to do and be the God of their own universe, they choose not to believe in God and so they look to alternative options. But it takes more faith to believe that there's not a God than it does to have faith that there is a God. But let me say this for you who might be skeptics here today. And even if you're not a skeptic here today, you might wanna remember this because just because you or someone doesn't believe in God doesn't mean that God goes away and that God doesn't exist. You can believe that two plus two does not equal four, but it doesn't mean that's true. It just means that you're really stupid. And so too, people who don't believe that there's a God, it doesn't mean that it's true or true for them. It just means that they're really, really foolish. For Psalms 14 verse one says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You can believe gravity doesn't exist and you can climb up top of a building or a parking structure and jump off and, and you can sing, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. But guess what? You're still gonna fall and splat. Because just because you don't believe in gravity doesn't mean that it goes away. And so too with God. People can say, I don't believe in that. As if that makes God somehow just vanish or disappear. If I put him out of my mind, I don't think about him then I don't have to deal with the fact that there may be a God. And so the world is without excuse, Romans chapter one, because heavens declare the glory of God, that creation declares that there is a God. And so we have a testimony of creation around us in the days in which we live, where relativism is propagated, where there is no absolutes being taught on college campuses. No truth, whatever's true for you is good for you. Whatever's true for me is good for me. And we see where that's getting the world. So like yesterday, we have someone that goes into a club and shoots the club up and kills 50 people, the largest mass shooting in our country's history. And we wonder why is that taking place? Why are things because of moral depravity? 
People denying that there is a God, and if you have no God, then there's no answer. What's true for you is true for you. That's being taught in the college campuses. That's what the liberal agenda is propagating. No absolutes. No absolutes? Well, I always like to ask the question, are you absolutely sure? Because even in the statement, there are no absolutes, is an absolute statement. You see? It's being propagated. Whatever is good for you, you go and do. If you like that sin, if you like that lifestyle, then you go and indulge in that. I, I, I can't be one to say that you're not a man or you're not a woman. I can't be one to say that you're not five feet tall when really you're six feet five. I can't say that you can identify yourself in that way. I can't, why? Because there's, there's it's whatever's true for you. But when we believe that and we adopt that mentality, that way of thinking, then here's where it goes to. Where I can pull a gun on you and take your wallet and, and walk away. Why? Because it's good for me. Why not? How many of you have a, a wallet in your pocket right now? Anybody have a wallet in their pocket? You got a wallet in your pocket? Can I see it real quick? Let me see it real quick. It's an example. Okay, perfect. He's got a badge in here. I better not steal his wallet. Matt, you got a wallet on you? Okay, thank you. You never know who you're trying to rob nowadays. Thank you. Matt's wallet. Let's see what we got in here. Whew, you never know how, how much you're gonna be held accountable in church, what you have in your wallet. Matt Garcia, an amazing worship leader, by the way. Perfect, a license. We got a chase card. Freedom, freedom card, it's the freedom card. Freedom in Christ and freedom in chase, apparently, okay? Well, there's some good stuff in here, some Best Buy gift cards, I'll take that. Perfect, all right, anyways, keep moving on. Why can I take his wallet? Well, because it's good for me. I want his wallet, so, so I'll just keep it. But, but Matt might say at this point, other than him being a very respectful person to his pastor, might object and say, hey, that's my wallet. You can't take my wallet. Yeah, I can. Huh, it's good for me. Is there really, is, is there really no truth? Is what's good for me really the right thing to do? But people will try to stand by what is good for them or what they want to do and justify it by using the argument that it's all relative. It might be good for you, but it might not be good for me. And people are guided by what they want to think instead of what is actually true. Thank you, Matt. I'm not going to keep your wallet. Oh, sorry. I just exploded your wallet. I'll buy you a new one. Uh, so we have the testimony that there is a God, that there is truth through creation. And just because you don't believe in him does not mean that he doesn't exist. Number two, we also have the testimony of the prophets among us. See, throughout all of history, God had sent prophets, men of God, to declare who he is. And Hebrews chapter one, verse one says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. The prophets came speaking truth of God to man. And what did the people do that heard the message of the prophets? They killed them. They just killed them. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to listen to God's message of repentance, that there is a God, that there would be a judgment for your sin. And what are you going to do with that? They didn't want to deal with that, so they killed them. They just killed them. They didn't want to have to face it. We don't want to hear that message. And listen, God has given us a message through the prophets. It's a message of prophecy. God has given prophecy in the word of God, the Bible, where one third of the entire Bible is prophecy. So much prophecy that's been fulfilled that it's proof, predicting things that would happen in the future you see, it's impossible to be absolutely certain of what will take place in the future because there's so many different variables that could happen. I mean, people can't even predict the weather of what tomorrow's forecast will look like, let alone exact events. But throughout the Bible, there's exact events, even 
hundreds of years before Christ even came, how he would come, where he would come, how he would die. 400 prophecies specifically about Jesus Christ, all filled perfectly. But not only prophecies about Jesus, but what will happen in the world in the times in which even we live, even coming to pass before our eyes. You see, we are given a message confirmed through prophecy. And through the prophets, we can see that there's truth to what the word of God has to say. Prophecy, fulfilled prophecy is one of the greatest evidences of the truth of God's word because every other religious book has some prophecy, some very little, but many of it never came to pass. Many of it had to be changed and re-edited to make it no longer null and void. Different prophecies that aren't true, that weren't fulfilled, but the Bible, one by one, every single one fulfilled perfectly to the T. And the only ones that haven't yet been filled are prophecies about something that's still to take place in the future. For you see, Israel becoming a nation again was the last prophecy needing to be fulfilled before the return of Jesus Christ. And we saw that happen in 1948. Israel becoming a nation once again. The next event on the prophetical calendar is the return of Jesus Christ for his church, the rapture of the church. You see, prophecy, the only prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled are those that would come after the rapture of the church. That's what's to happen next. So we have evidence through the prophecy given and the prophets among us that spoke to humanity throughout the ages that there is a God. And number three, the conscience within us. See, we are born with a sense of what's right and wrong. We have an intuition of truth and knowledge of a God. That's why Romans chapter one, verse 18 and 19 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. God has created every single person with the innate knowledge that there is a God. Every person is created with an intuition of a knowledge of God, but what happens, the Bible says, is that they suppress the truth. They sear their conscience. They deny it because they don't wanna believe it. And because people don't wanna acknowledge that there is a God, they are gonna be faced with decisions of what to do if there is a God. You see, we either surrender our life to God or live in opposition to God. You see, people know that there's a God. They, they, they have a, everybody's created with a knowledge, even of right and wrong. Even, even a little baby knows what's right and wrong. You know, when they're going over to do something that they, they shouldn't do, like stick their finger in an outlet, you know, they, they look over their shoulder. Are you watching me? And if, if they get caught, hey, what are you doing? Don't do that. They stop for a second until you stop looking at them. And then they go try to get away with it anyways. I mean, they're just little sinners. But they know what's right and what's wrong, and they're guilty. You see, so too, all of humanity, we, we know. We're created with that knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. But when you suppress the truth long enough, well, then your conscience becomes seared and you begin to live in this area of where you're not sure if this is right or wrong. No matter where you are, whether it's in the jungle or in the inner city or in New York City, another jungle, no matter what place you live in, if you really are looking for God, God will make sure you find your way to Christ. How do I know? Proverbs chapter eight, verse 17 says this, and those who seek me diligently will find me. That's a promise of God's word. If you seek God, you, God has revealed through creation around us, through the prophets among us, and through our, our conscience within us, God has revealed himself to humanity so you know that there is a God. And if you seek God for God diligently, if you're truly seeking God, he will reveal himself to you. Here's a great example. In Acts chapter 10, there's a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And it says that Cornelius was a devout man. 
who was praying continuously. And when he was praying one day, God sent an angel to him. And he told Cornelius, that angel did, that he needed to go find a man in Joppa named Simon Peter. And so Cornelius, who was seeking God, wanting to know truth about God, God miraculously sent an angel to tell him a word to go find a man named Simon Peter. And so he did. He sent his servants to go ask Simon Peter to come and the Lord prepared Simon Peter to, to be ready to go. And at the same time, Simon Peter went and he preached the gospel and Cornelius and his whole household was saved. You see, he was seeking God diligently and he found the message of Jesus Christ. You see, some people say, well, I'm seeking. I'm a seeker. I'm seeking the truth. Hey, I'm even seeking God. Really? Well, hey, here's a Bible. Read this. God will, ah, I'm not going to read the Bible. Why, why not? Oh, I don't need the Bible. Okay, well, then at least would you come to church with me? Nope, not going to do that. Never. Crazy. Then how are you seeking God? Marijuana. <laughs> I'm going to smoke a lot of it. I'm going to find God that way. Listen, if you truly seek God diligently, you will find him. But people will try to use excuses to do what they want to do as an excuse to seek after God. You're not seeking God. People don't want the opportunity for the gospel to be presented in their life because they know deep down inside it's true. How do I know? You can go to any college campus, campus and you can talk about Buddha, you can talk about Hinduism, you can talk about the Muslim faith, you can talk about any religion. You name Jesus Christ and what do people do? They get angry, they get upset. Why is it only when you talk about Jesus people get upset? Because people are created with an innate knowledge that it's true and they don't want to be faced with it. They don't want to have to come to the realization that there is a God. But even when people aren't seeking God, even when those that don't want God, listen to this, it's Luke chapter 19 verse 10 where it says about Jesus, for the son of man, a name for Jesus, has come to seek and save that which was lost. God's heart is to reach out to people and he will go out of his way to see people saved. And I can say that with complete authority because Jesus left his throne in heaven to be made lower than the angels, Hebrews chapter one, to become a human, God, who knew no sin, became sin, lived his life without sin, but took on our sin the day he died on the cross for sin. And when he died, he paid the price for our sin. If Jesus was willing to go out of his way to leave his throne in heaven, to come and, and die a brutal death on the cross, being crucified, crucifixion, where we get our English word excruciating from. If Jesus was willing to do that, then I know he's willing to do whatever is necessary to go out of his way to see people saved. It's the heart of Jesus Christ. And even in the day of tribulation, God still is going out of his way to see people get saved. To end, Revelation chapter 14. I know you were wondering, are we even ever gonna get to the book of Revelation? It's Revelation chapter 14, verses six and seven, where God sends an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. You see, even in that day of the tribulation, Revelation chapter six through 19 describes that period of time that will come in time that describes the great tribulation where God pours out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. 
But even in that time of people that have wanted nothing to do with God, that have denied God, that have rather tried to die with rocks, fallenness, when they see God, they don't want to turn to God, so they turn to the rocks and say, kill us. They'd rather die than turn to Jesus Christ because of the hardness of their hearts. And even in that time in the world, God still is reaching out to humanity. The 144,000 witnesses that we saw in chapters past, a bunch of Jewish Billy Grahams running around preaching the gospel. Kosher Billy Grahams <laughs> declaring to the world who Jesus is. But not only the 144,000 that go throughout the world, but the two witnesses there in Jerusalem, the whole world witnesses that they're killed and that they rise again declaring who Jesus is. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. But now, not only the 144,000 witnesses and the two witnesses, but now we have an angel flying, preaching the gospel. And it says to every nation, every tribe that's in the jungle, tongue and people, every single person will get the message of Jesus Christ. You see, God sends an angelic mop-up operation to clean up, let people know. So don't worry about the person in the jungle if someone is truly seeking God, if they stop suppressing the truth and they see God in the creation around them or the conscience within them or the prophets among them, then they will know that there is a God. And if they seek God, God promises that he will reveal himself to them. This is the heart of Jesus Christ, that none would perish that all would have everlasting life. And Christ did what was necessary, whatever he possibly could to reach to you. You know, in, in dating, you know, you go a little bit and you expect the other person to go a little bit. You know, you call them. Guys, it's your job to call the girl. Just a little help trying to get you married. You ask for her number, you beg for it if necessary. You let her know, I would love to get dinner with you sometime. And if you, can, oh, you can't do dinner, I would love to do lunch with you sometime or breakfast. Girl, I would do tea and crumpets with you if it meant getting 10 minutes alone. And then you call her, you call her again. But there comes a time after you call her about 15 times where you begin to get the hint. There's no reciprocation. Kind of have to meet in the middle. You know, like Hitch. Guys go 90% of the way, the girl's gotta come 10. <laughs> but listen. <laughs> God has gone the whole way. He went 100% of the way. He came to the earth. He died on the cross for your sin, and he gives you salvation, that you don't have to do anything. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. The work has been done, the price has been paid. There's nothing more for you to do to be saved other than simply receive a free gift of salvation. And so he went the whole way. Christ has done whatever he possibly could do to see you saved. So when people say, how could God send a person to hell? Listen, God's done everything and continues to do everything he possibly can to get a hold of your heart. But it comes a point where you have to make that decision, where you make that choice, whether you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or you reject Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with Jesus? God will take care of the person in the jungle but what are you going to do with Jesus Christ today? Because they might not have a knowledge of who Jesus is in a direct way, but just in the Old Testament, how God counted them as righteous because they believed in God by faith. Not even really knowing God, but they believed in God by faith. God said, that's enough. You have enough faith to be saved. And so they were. But put that question aside, which is really just a distraction anyways to deter the conversation in a different direction. The question that we all have to be faced with today is what are you going to do with Jesus today?
You see, you have knowledge of Jesus Christ. Even in sitting through this Bible study, you realize that Jesus is God, that he died for your sins. He paid the price so that you wouldn't have to. He gave his life so that you could have life. What are you going to do with that? You see, God spoke through creation around us and the conscience within us and the prophets among us. But there's a final way that God revealed himself. And that's in sending his son. Hebrews chapter one, verse two says this, God has in these last days spoken to us by his son. God has been trying to get your attention, trying to reveal himself to you, to get through to you, but are you listening? Listen, there's nothing else that God can do to reveal himself other than to come himself. And the most powerful picture that you can see of Jesus and his love is him on the cross and what he's done for you individually. He gave his life so that you wouldn't have to spend an eternity, eternity apart from him. But are you listening? Are you listening to that very powerful message that people try to tune out and not deal with? I don't wanna hear about that. I don't wanna talk about that. I don't wanna face that. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, it's too loud of a message to be able to ignore. Too loud of a message to be able to tune out. It's a clear message that Jesus loves you. Are you listening? What are you gonna do with it?